This is the 63rd lecture in the FOA series of lectures on fiber optics. In this lecture, and the three following it, we are going to be updating lecture 25, done almost a decade ago, to introduce our listeners to fiber to the home. In the last decade, fiber to the home has gone from being a new whiz-bang technology to the routine way that broadband is delivered to subscribers. There have been lots of new developments in technology, especially in the components area, and some in the architecture area that we'll cover in this series of lectures to bring you up to date. So if you haven't listened to Lecture 25, you should start there and then listen to these. When fiber to the home first became a viable technology about a decade ago, there were lots of different options and lots of different acronyms used. Fiber to the home, fiber to the premises, fiber to the curb, fiber to the node, fiber to the building, fiber to wireless. And then we sort of lumped them all into this thing called FTTX for those who can't decide what to call it or why are referring to all the varieties. So we're going to talk about some of those varieties now, and we'll explain them, and we'll talk about why they have been accepted or rejected since Fiber of the Home was first proposed. Initially, the telephone companies, who own lots of landlines made out of copper to practically every subscriber that had a phone, proposed fiber to the curb, and the idea was you would run fiber from a central office to a local switch, typically sitting in a pedestal in a subdivision or in the basement of a building or the like, and then you would use the current twisted pair copper cable to connect up to the customer. The problem is those copper cables were, well, not really capable of delivering broadband as we think of it, in 2021. Fiber to the curb and delivering broadband over twisted pair phone lines into the home sounds like a great idea. The problem is it's sort of limited by the age of the copper wires going into the home and the laws of physics because you see twisted pair can only carry so much bandwidth so far and the length of in in copper cable that supports what we think of as common broadband networks today, which is, well, 25 megabits per second is sort of in the real low end, and the fiber to the home people are talking about gigabits per second, it just doesn't work well with copper, especially old copper. But you have to admit, the copper people did a lot of uh, work on this. They came up with more than 23 different varieties of technologies to do copper DSL. None of them work particularly well. So by 2021, all of the telephone companies had basically abandoned DSL and said that fiber to the home was going to be the way they had to deliver broadband. An alternative to using copper or fiber to connect the home is, of course, wireless. And over the years, there have been many different ways of making wireless a way to provide broadband to the home. Uh, cellular service uh, up until uh, recently just simply didn't have the bandwidth. But uh, the proponents of 5G cellular keep promising that it's going to solve all our problems, but uh, they haven't proven it with field applications yet. What has happened is in a lot of rural areas, uh, line of sight Wi-Fi has been used to connect users where it's very expensive to connect users with fiber. The line-of-sight wireless connection with Wi-Fi could basically be called fiber-to-wireless. What you basically do is have 
an antenna station at some point connected up on a fiber backbone and it uses line of sight Wi-Fi to connect up users. This can be used anywhere fiber links are expensive. Uh, both urban and rural networks are used where the difficulty or the cost of installing fiber is too high. Wireless has a tendency to be sensitive to weather. That's going to be especially a problem with 5G. And it's not cheap and especially not cheap to upgrade. It has to have full-time power to be working and it has a lot of downsides. But where fiber is too expensive, it's certainly a viable option. Fiber to the home even has a number of options. There's a simple home run where you run fiber from the central office to every home. An active star where you have a local switch connecting users over short lengths of fiber. But the most popular system today is a passive optical network, what we call a PON, which uses optical splitters near the customers to share the fiber to the central office. PON uses wavelength division multiplexing, but some versions of PONs have each customer having a specified wavelength. That's nowhere near as popular as the standard basic GPON kind of structure we're going to talk about. All PON structures are based on simple, inexpensive, single-mode fiber and use this in installation techniques that will be familiar to most installers. And that's part of what's made it so popular. The first FTTH architecture we'll talk about is home run or point to point. Basically, every subscriber has a dedicated fiber that goes from a central office electronics, typically like an ethernet switch, to the home. The problem is every subscriber has to have a fiber. And in, and in some networks, that means a lot of fibers. If you've got 100,000 subscribers, you're going to have 100,000 fibers. And that can be a problem, particularly in dense urban areas. Another option for fiber to the home is use an active star or ethernet network. Basically, sort of like a local area network and uh, an enterprise network. You have a central office talking to an active node. The active node is an ethernet switch, and the ethernet switch then connects to individual subscribers. This has the downside that the active node requires space, electronics, power, uninterruptible power, and service. Uh, there's a better way to do it, and it's called a passive optical network. We can replace that active node switch with a fiber optic passive splitter. A passive optical network gets rid of the electronic switch and basically replaces it with an optical splitter. An optical splitter takes one incoming fiber signal and divides it out to a number of other fibers. That splitter works bi-directional. So if that fiber sends a signal back upstream toward the central office, the splitter acts as a combiner on the upstream, combines it into a single mode fiber that goes back to a single port in a piece of electronics in the central office. That's the essence of a pawn. One port in a central office switch can service up to 32 or even 64 users by going through a passive splitter. Passive optical networks have lots of advantages. There's no electronics in the link. You need no electronics between your head end or central office and your subscriber. It's bi-directional over a single fiber. So signals go downstream to the subscribers and back upstream to the central office switch. It's a very low-cost network. 
both in capital expenditure and in operating expenditure. It can, can carry any kind of traffic. It's generally all digital, but it's Ethernet, and we basically know how to put anything on Ethernet these days. It's also secure. If you notice, the downstream signal is split to many users. That means all users are getting the same basic signal. In order to ensure security and privacy, the system has to be encrypted. So all passive optical networks are already encrypted, which makes them very popular with government agencies and the military. If a pawn has a disadvantage, it's a little more difficult to design than a point-to-point -point network because you have to figure out where are the optimum points to put your splitters. If all your subscribers are very close to the head end or central office, it may be easier to simply put the optical splitter in the central office and run a fiber from the central office to each subscriber. Remember, this only works for relatively short lengths, like dense urban areas. The advantage of having the optical splitter in the central office is you can be more efficient at using splitter ports. And uh, that's a complicated kind of thing we'll talk about in the design uh, video, which will come along later. But this is one of the options which is used by quite a number of networks. One splitter, central office, multiple fibers, one to each subscriber. If your density of subscribers isn't as high, for example in a suburban area, you may want to go the opposite way. Move your splitters out closer to the subscribers. And in fact, you can cascade splitters. So for example, you can have an optical splitter that's less than the maximum number you can handle, at one point splitting out to other splitters that are closer to the, to the users. So for example, if you have four houses on a cul-de-sac, you run a fiber to the cul-de-sac and use a four-port splitter to connect those four houses up. Many, if no, not most networks today use a cascaded splitter architecture. In dense urban areas, most subscribers will probably be in multi-dwelling units. Uh, the business tends to call those MDUs. Multi-dwelling units are like apartments or condominiums. And one of the ways of handling them is very simple. You bring a cable to the building. In the building, you put a splitter, and then you run a fiber to every unit in the building. And that's the most common way of doing multi-dwelling units. If the multi-dwelling unit has a lot of residents, and you need lots of fiber in it, you can use the cascaded coupler method very easily. You put the initial splitter in the basement of the building, and then, for example, put a splitter on each hallway. And fiber then only has to run from one end of the hallway to the other. This can be a very efficient way of dealing with multi-dwelling units. Some buildings are connected to fiber by just bringing fiber into the building and then using the copper cables already in the building. There are, of course, uh, methods of using phone lines, what we call DSL, or Digital Subscriber Line. And there are even techniques to use the video cables, like for cable or satellite TV, to connect internet into each of the units in the building. This is another option if the cables are capable of handling broadband speeds. Rural networks are much more difficult to design, mainly because the distances are much longer and the number of subscribers are much lower, which really affects the design and the cost of the network. 
There have been a number of different proposals to handle this, one of which involves not using splitters, but using taps, where you just have a fiber that continues along and you tap off a small amount of the light for each subscriber. The problem is that taps aren't very efficient, and we've done lost budgets on several designs like this, and they simply don't work because the excess loss in each splitter causes you to lose distance in reach. A better alternative is probably to use long reach GPON, which can get you out 60 kilometers. Another option for rural that looks much more viable is the designers of the PON equipment have come up with what's called a mini OLT. It's basically a little box that sits on a uh, pole in the countryside. Looks a little bit like the box that cable TV uses for their hybrid fiber coax systems. And has an OLT port that will handle a certain number of users. These devices, some people call them mini OLTs, can be daisy changed. So you can basically go as far as you want to. And you basically only need two fibers to connect each of them. This is probably a more viable system, and we'll talk about that some more in the design video coming up. For other resources to learn about this, we recommend you go to the FOE Reference Guide. It is a large section of pages on fiber to the home and passive optical networks. And of course, Fiber U, where you'll find a fiber to the home course that you can take for free. FiberU is the FOA's free online learning site and has over two dozen free fiber optic courses. We're the Fiber Optic Association, the International Professional Association of Fiber Optics, and the internationally recognized certifying body for fiber optic technicians. You'll find we have the resources that can help you learn about anything in fiber optics. Just start at our websites, foa.org and fiberu.org.